Can you introduce yourself and tell us how you got in the business? Uh, my name is Petey Williams, and I got in the business about, I don't know, uh, five years ago, four or five years ago. I had my first match like maybe four years ago. And just I trained up in Windsor at the Can-Am Wrestling School under Scott Demore. And I've been wrestling for an organization called NWA TNA. And that's my story. How'd you get into the business? Um, I, well, when I was younger, you know, like, uh, backyard was the big thing. I never did any backyard wrestling, but, you know, I was like, you know, me and my friends, we're going to, you know, start a backyard wrestling federation. It's going to be great, you know. Uh, you know, the big time is going to call us. We're going to be professional wrestlers, but... You know, I was like, you know, I need to start working out first. So I knew the steps I had to take. I just didn't know how to go about doing it. And uh, I started working out. And then I met this guy at the gym that I worked out at. He he worked, like, at the counter. He was one of the trainers or whatnot. And he knew a guy that wrestled for an organization called Border City Wrestling that's up in Canada. And uh, he said he wanted to get into wrestling and me and him were kind of tight and he says yeah you know you said you want to be a wrestler too why don't you come and check it out he took me there and then uh, you know since then he's quit the business and you know I went on so that's pretty much uh, how I got in what um like the landscape of the wrestling industry right now like do you feel it's like in a monopoly still to extent or what's your opinion on that um well it's hard like I'm just going by facts and what's on the internet like it's not you know, what people don't know already. Um, you know, WWE's making a lot of money, um, like, doing what they're doing. And, you know, WCW was the other one that was always on, you know, they were on a roll, too, making money. ECW was even at one point, too. And everybody knows that TNA, you know, however many millions of dollars they went in the hole. So, I mean, we're still going up. We're putting on great pay-per-views and, you know, TV. we got great wrestlers there, just that... If Monopoly is, like, if there's one wrestling organization that's making big money, then I guess, yeah, it is kind of Monopoly, you know? But uh, I'd say, I mean, TNA still has a long way to go, but, you know, hopefully if, you know, the fans take on and, you know, I don't know when this is going to air, but, uh, you know, there's big talks, like we might get a Spike TV deal. Everybody's heard about that on the Internet. So if that goes on, you know, hopefully that's great for, uh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Sorry. It happens to be his car. So, um, like, what about the politics in wrestling? Like, has politics held you back at all? Or uh, have you felt, like, the wrath of the politicians in the wrestling industry? Um, actually, well, the only big organization I've ever worked for. Like, I've never stepped foot in a WWE ring, and that's the other big organization. Never WCW or ECW. And, you know, every organization you go to, there's politics, um, even, like, the little ones, you know. Um, but, I mean, TNA, if anything, I'd say politics worked for me because, you know, not that I'm, I, I wouldn't even know how to play the politics game if, you know, it came to me. Um, but, you know, Scott Demore got me into border, or, uh, for, to TNA, and, uh, it, it, like, it, he wasn't even booking, it wasn't even his decision when they put the X title on me, it was, uh, you know, Jeff Jarrett and Dutch Mantel's decision, and, but, you know, Scott did secure a job for me there, so if anything, I guess I, I played the politics, you know, I never, you know, I worked my way up, but it just that, you know, I know a lot of guys have a lot, you know, tougher time working their way up, but I guess, you know, I guess in the wrestling business, it's like, you know, right place at the right time, that's the best way to put it. What was it like training to be a pro wrestler? Was it, like, harder than you expected? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure everybody always says this, like, they think they're going to go in. Ouch. They think they're going to go in and, uh, you should be filming that stuff over there. <laughs> um, they think they're going to go in there and they're going to run the place, you know, they're going to be, you know, the next, you know, Hulk Hogan or whatever. And, you know, every, every kid thinks that. You know, they see on TV, they're like, you know, I want to be that guy. That's why you want to become a professional wrestler. You want to be that guy and, uh, you know, you want to be your idol there. And You know, it, but it, it was a big wake-up call for me when I was like, okay, you know, let's start doing some punches today. And they're like, no, no, no. How about first, you know, we teach you how to run the ropes and fall on your back properly so you don't break your neck or whatever. 
you know. So that was a big wake up. Like punching is like the last thing you learn, in like a proper wrestling school. So uh, it was a big wake up call for me. It was ex like exact opposite of what I was thinking. I remember I went home after my first night, and I was a little sore. And then I woke up the next day, and all of these muscles right here were like I couldn't even lift my head head up out of bed. It was like like the the worst pain ever. And I remember when I went to the gym like the next day to work out, and you have to lay back on the bench. I had to grab the back of my head and go like, and slowly place it back because I couldn't use any of these muscles. And then like two days later, I went to wrestling practice and I said, you know, to the trainer, I'm like, I just want to take it easy today, you know, my neck. And he's just kind of like, well, okay, sure. And the next thing you know, I'm bumping all over again and, you know, I'm straining my neck. But, you know, it all worked out in the best, I guess. Like, how does the wrestling industry in Canada, or what are the fans, like, the difference between wrestling from the Canadian fans and, and wrestling from the American fans, like, is there a difference? Um, like, yes and no, like, in the U.S. they have a lot more access to wrestling, like, I remember growing up in Canada, um, like, we didn't really get ECW, you know, and... I don't, I don't remember. WCW was played like the day later, and I remember like uh, Raw was on at like like midnight. You know, it was just like all like we never had like the we like, we don't have the USA Network obviously, and uh, you know stuff like that. So the access to wrestling isn't as much over there. But I mean, the the Canadian fans are still like really educated. Like every time I wrestle like like really up like I'm I'm like in the most from the most southern part of Canada in Windsor, and. Uh, you know, it's almost like we're like really Americanized over there. We have a lot of Americans, you know, coming over the border and stuff. So the the group I wrestled for in Border City, you know, it's a lot of Americans, a lot of Canadians there. It's, you know, it's pretty much the same. But when I go way up north, you know, and, you know, they're, they're French and stuff like that. And I, I play the Canadian, you know, angle anyway. So, you know, like they, you know, they love me up in Canada, you know, regardless. Um... But I'd say the fans are pretty much all the same all over the place except for, like, I don't know, like the Alabama, Nashville states, like the really southern states where, you know, they're still into, like, 1987 wrestling, you know, and they'll, they're like, yeah, you know, and you don't, like, it's, like, unbelievable what they're into, you know, and then if you have the same match, you know, in, you know, California or Canada, they'll be like, you know, what the, you know, what the hell's this, what the hell's this shit, you know, so... How about the Canadian Destroyer? Like, when you invented that move, like, that's, like, a really, really unique move. And it looks really high risk. Like, how did you uh, create that? Well, everybody asks me that everywhere I go. And, uh, I always give them, what do you, like, you want the fake answer I give everybody? Like, I got, like, three of them. And yeah, what's the fake ones first? The, the fake ones, well, my newest one is I say, you know, well, ha like everybody says, it defies the laws of physics, you know. UIJJ style is jump off the top rope and do his spiral tap or whatever it's called. It's defying the laws of physics, you know. It looks like he pauses in midair, then he like flips seven times the way down. You watch Drell Clark, you know, he'll do like a 630 degree flip, you know. And then if you watch it's like me, I'll do the like the flip with the back flip, and it's like, you know, how's that possible? And I say this is what it is, and I'm gonna let everybody in on a wrestling secret right now. It's kung fu fire white. Fire, wire fighting harnesses, just like in the movies, man. And the reason why WWE doesn't do all the flips yet is because they don't have the technology. You know, it all goes to Hollywood. You don't see them on TNA TV. You know, it all goes to Hollywood. And uh, yeah, just that's what we do in TNA. What, so. What's the what's the real reason? The real way it was created. Well, see, like in wrestling, it just it's so. This is what I love about it because. Everybody thinks they know everything about wrestling. Wrestling's, you know, fixed, you know. Everybody knows people get hurt in wrestling, but it's fixed. It's choreographed, all that type stuff, you know what I mean? And what's great about wrestling is that everybody can see through everybody else. But when, whenever, like, a move like that comes out, they're like, how do you do it? You know, how do you do it? And it's just like, you know, I think something should left to be said, like, how do you do it? You know what I mean? Maybe it should be left in the business just for the boys to know. You know what I mean? But, uh, I mean, it just, it, it came to, uh, you know, a couple of us guys were talking. We talked about how, 
you know, like a flipping pile driver or whatever, like people thought it up or whatever. And I wanted to do it one day, and then, um, you know, I did it to Matt Seidel for the first time, and, you know, I, I didn't really think it was going to work, you know. I had him kick out of it because I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't know how it's going to look. I might fall on my head, you know. But it looked great, and then ever since then, my career went up. But I'd say the more important, like everybody asks, how do you invent it? How do you invent it? I like when people ask, like, how... Like, where'd you come up with it? Why, why'd you call it the Canadian Destroyer? So I'll answer that question. Then. Um, the first, like, indie show I ever went to was in Windsor. And it was just when I was starting out in the business. I thought it was great because I was able to do security at the show. And the only, like, wrestling, like I said before, we, like, in Canada, wrestling, like, we didn't really get to see a lot outside of, like, WWE and stuff like that. So when I saw an indie show and guys doing flips off the top ropes, I was like, what the... I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, and I was just in awe, and I'm like, this is my life. I'm like, I want to do this stuff. And I was just so amazed by it. But the show I went to was called uh, the Doug Chevalier Memorial Show, the first annual one. There's this guy named Doug Chevalier who wore a mask, and he was called the Canadian Destroyer, Doug Chevalier. And he's the one that trained Scott Demore, and Scott Demore trained me. And so, you know, just trying to keep the generation on and, you know, that's that's how the name came about, which nobody cares about, but I like to tell that story because I think it's more meaningful than uh, how he came up with it. I mean, how people come up with moves, they just think of it in their head, you know, so. Have you ever injured anybody with that move? Uh, never. No, because it looks like really high impact. Yeah, and see, that's what I mean about people, like, they see through everything else, but they look at that and they're like, man, there's even wrestlers, like, sometimes that I've never met before, and, you know, and they'll have to wrestle me and they'll be like, uh, yeah, that Canadian destroyer thing, you know, I mean, and they get, you know, they're kind of all nervous and going like this, and I'm like, dude, I'm like, I've never heard anybody with it, you know, I'm like, like, that's what's so great about it, that you could, there's still, like, there's still hope for wrestling for, for, you know, the fans not see through everything, you know what I mean? Just because they've seen so much wrestling, they're so educated now, there's so much stuff on the internet, that, you know, when you don't see through something like that, it's just, I mean, that's what I love about it, when you can trick the fans. So. What's your opinion of like the creative process of wrestling, like the storylines, creative characters? Do you think they're doing that well, or do you think that that can be done better? Uh, it depends where you go. I mean, I mean, like storylines are storylines. I mean, when you when you, oh, where do I start? Okay, I just made my Ring of Honor debut. And I went there, and I'd never, like, really watched, like, their sh type of show. I've never wrestled for them. I just, when I went there, it was, you know, it reminded me of this, of how the ECW fans used to be. The ECW fans made the show, you know what I mean? And just made the wrestlers work so much harder in front of those fans because they were so, they, they were just insane. And that's how Ring of Honor reminds me of, like, sort of like how the ECW fans were. They make the show, you know, they, you know, and no matter what, I mean, you know, Gabe has some really good ideas, you know, and, and storylines and stuff. But, I mean, I think that no matter what, I, like, it doesn't matter what you do in storylines. You know what I mean? Like, the fans make the show. The fans will buy into whatever they want to buy into. You know what I mean? Like, some some of, the, like, the stupidest stuff coming in storylines, like, the, the recent one now, they started getting over, like, that viscera angle. You know, it's just like, I'm sure when the Raiders wrote that, they were just like, all right, well, just give them something to do on the show, you know. And the next thing you know, it gets over, and it's like, it's like, oh, wow, let's run with this, you know? W which is great. Whenever, w what I love about wrestling is whenever I watch it and somebody that was down here can get over with the fans and be, like, like the next, like, whoever, you know, and just have the huge fan reaction, the fans get behind them. That's what I love because whenever somebody can get that big and get the fans on their side, I mean, like, they deserve it, no matter if they're a good wrestler or not. You know, so that's, 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 I don't so much mark out for wrestling. I mark out for like, you know, when I watch something, I'm like, man, he got that over. You know, he, he, you know, the fans are buying into that. That's what I love about it, how people get things over. Um, let me ask you about, uh, like you, you had the dream to be a pro wrestler. Like at what age did that start for you? Like everybody else, like six years old. You know, I mean, I'm sure it was the same for you, you know, I mean, even I bet you all the fans sitting in the crowd, you know, wanting to be a pro wrestler, just some people, 
have the athletic ability, have the genetics, you know, have the look, whatever, you know, to be able to to come one. And I mean, yeah, six years old, you know, 17 years ago, I saw Hulk Hogan and it was all over. I'm like, oh man, it doesn't get much better than this, you know. So <laughs> that was that was my dream. But what was your fantasy like back when you were a little kid, just thinking about this? Did you have like a particular dream or a certain wrestler you wanted to wrestle in the ring? Um, no, I mean, like when you're a kid, you don't think like you buy into anything. Like look at Hulk Hogan's comeback, punch, 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 big boot, leg drop, end of WrestleMania five. You know what I mean? Um, you know, like I like back then, you don't say, like, I want to wrestle this guy. You're just like, I want to be him, you know? That's why I used to go to the shows, put on the Hulkamania t-shirt with the bandana. You know, I wanted to be him. You know, that's what I was worried about. Little did I know that I'd have to train to be a wrestler, you know, that, you know, like stuff like that. It's a process, just like going through school, you know? I'm a kid. But then as I grew up, like, more and more in life, you know, your parents and other people... You know, get in your head like, okay, what are you going to go to school for? What are you going to go to college for? You have to have a real job, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know the story. And, you know, that's when I'm like, okay, maybe I'll be a wrestler if it ever falls in my lap. You know what I mean? And, you know, right now I'll work for, like, a real job. And then just when I start going through college, I halfway through, I, you know, train to be a wrestler. And then the rest is history, so... Screw what everybody else says. Get a real job. Like, go for your dreams. That's what I say. Let me ask you, a, like, if you don't want to answer this question, it's cool. I, I always ask this to everybody. You know, I ask AJ and Daniels. They do both the two. I always ask questions about like, drugs and unions. Um, like, like I'll start off with unions. Like, like just like this past week. Did you say unions? Yeah, yeah. The rest was forming a union. Oh, okay. Um, like this past week, like. 18 guys from Vince McMahon's company were released. Um, like, d- does that motivate you and other wrestlers to form a union? No, because I say, well, I'd say, I don't know what, what they say. I say no, what they say. Um, you remember? AJ, uh, I, he, he kind of agreed with you. It, it all depends, like, on the status of the wrestler, like, how high up he is and stuff like that. See, I'd say no because, I mean... Like, unions are usually made for big corporations, for benefits, and yada, yada, yada. And you got to pay all these union dues and stuff. I remember I worked for a union once. Excuse me. Before I was a wrestler, I worked for uh, Chrysler's part-time while I went to school. And uh, I was in a union. And, what like, what was bullshit is, like, I was the little guy, which is would probably be those guys that just got released from WWE. I was the little guy because I was just a student. I was paying my union dues just like all the full-time people. And just that... Like, I, I didn't get any benefits. Like, if, if something, I didn't like something, like, and want the bitch, the union would never stick up for me. Like, I had, like, absolutely, it was like I wasn't even in the union, but I'm paying, like, you know, whatever percentage I had to pay for them, you know, and, like, I, I would, I would I'd bitch about it, and they'd be like, well, you're making all this money going to school. I'm like, well, fuck, I'm doing the same job as everybody else. You know what I mean? Just like those those wrestlers got released, they're doing the same job as everybody else. But I mean, if they formed a union and they're paying their union dues, I mean, if they're like, then they're gonna start signing part-time wrestlers, full-time wrestlers. I mean, no matter what, like the head of the company is gonna win the battle, like it always is. And if you know, the like right now you couldn't do it because think about it. The WWE wrestlers went on strike. I bet you there's like 50 wrestlers sitting up there right now that'll be like, I'll be a scab and walk through and be on WWE TV. Why not? You know what I mean? I mean, like, there's kids who wrestle for like five bucks, you know, for free. You know? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's just ridiculous that like unions, it won't like, it's a name. Like it wouldn't do anything. I guarantee it wouldn't do anything. It would protect the top guys, I think, but like not the, the little guys that, you know, that really need it. So, and what was, what was the second one? Uh, like the drug abuse and wrestling, it, uh, it's definitely had its effect in the business. Yeah. It's taken several like really respected wrestlers and even guys on the indie scene. Um, like how has it affected the business, the drug abuse? Um, I mean, yeah, like in the 2000s, like there's been a lot of wrestlers that died. I mean, I can see, just like I'm on the road like all the time, um, 
especially when like TNA had TV and we're doing the pay-per-views and TV and I was on the road I was only home like two days a week and I could see like you know a lot of wrestlers take the painkillers and stuff like that like I stay away from that you know because I was you know Scott trained by Scott DeMore and he says you know stay away from those as long as possible you don't want to get hooked up in those you know what I mean and that's what kills you the painkillers and you got to take more and more to feel the effect and I mean I, I could I could definitely see how people get hooked on it and just want to you know you know or other drugs just to be away from reality because I mean it is boring being on the road I mean when you have to like fly to all these cities and like just waiting in the airport and you know I, I could just see how it is like I wouldn't do it just because it's not my lifestyle and you know I, re I respect my like you know my health more than that so but it definitely has a, had its effect on uh, on wrestling definitely so you don't think drugs will be obsolete from the wrestling business or that's like an impossible dream <laughs> impossible like <laughs> like come on I mean I don't like how how could you like if drugs are obsolete from the wrestling business then they, they could obsolete them from the rest of the world and we wouldn't have these problems you know what I mean wrestlers are just gonna get them because you know six degrees of separation you know what I mean like you know I know somebody that you know we're, we're connected to you along the way you know so I mean it'll never that's that's never happen never happen um have you ever been ribbed before? Or have you ever ribbed anybody? Like, uh, in particular, like a really funny story? Um. God, you're asking me to remember. See, see, that's another thing about being on the road, because you guys, all we do with pass the time is rib each other. Um. Well, I'll tell you the most recent one. And it's probably not the funniest one. I probably had a lot more. Shit, I wish I could remember some. Right, I'll just tell you the most recent one. Me and this uh, Team Canada member, A1, and Sabin, we're driving to, uh, we're driving back from the show up in Canada, and Sabin's like, I'm in the front driving, and A1's in the passenger seat, and we're driving Scott Demore's like, uh, one of his cars, and Sabin's curled up in the fetal position with his back to us, right? And A1's like, uh, pull over to this, pull over to this uh, service station here, I want to take a piss. So I'm like, all right, and then I go, hey, A1, hang on. We both look back at Saban, and I slam on the brakes, and it was like a cartoon. Saban, like, the car stopped, and Saban just flew. Boom! Nails the back of our seats, and then falls down on the ground. And he wakes what? Why'd you stop? Why'd you stop? You know, but, I mean, I don't know if that's as funny. It was, it, like, me and A1 laughed for, like, five minutes, you know, and I'm sure he'll get us back, uh, he'll get us back good. Oh, here's a more, another recent one. A1, okay, he's this, like, like, he's huge. Like, I don't know if you know who he is. Yeah. Okay, he's like, he's pretty huge, right? Um, we were in uh, Florida for TNA, and we had the Monday the day off, and it's like all, all sunny and stuff like that, and it's like really hot out. And A1's outside tanning by the uh, uh, by the pool there. And me and Saban are like, uh, we're going to go to the gym. I'm like, oh, we're going to pick up Daniel's car at the other, uh, the other hotel, and we'll pick you up, you know, get ready and shit. We'll be back in like 15 minutes. He's like, all right. So me and Saban are driving. And I'm like, you know what we should do to rib Al? I go, we should, cr we should, cause he'll be in the back, and, and uh, minivans have like the front controls and the back controls, and we cranked up the back control, full blast heat, and it's already like, you know, when you get in a car and it's so hot, and we're like, let's see how long it takes until he complains. He opens up the door, one foot steps in, he's like, holy fuck, it's hot in here, and just sweat is boring, and then <laughs> we're, me and Saban can't look at each other, cause we'll laugh, and I'm like, I don't know, Al, I got the air on you could you could hear it and then he's just like fuck roll down a window or something Saban goes D it rolls down that much right <laughs> and then we're driving and then we just start like laughing out loud like what are you guys stone and we're like <laughs> we're like yeah yeah we're, we're stoned and then I just go I can't take it anymore I blast up the cool and he's like you motherfuckers he's like you guys had the heat on you know and it's just so funny because everywhere you go a1's always like, man, it's fucking hot in here. You know, it's nice and cool out right now. Like, I'm not sweating. He'd probably be like, fuck, it's hot out here. Everywhere you go, he always complains about how hot it is and stuff. So, that's, I don't know. Like, you're asking me to remember ribs, like, 
those are just the two most recent ones we did like like a couple weeks ago so what's your uh, what do you what, what's like what do you have left that you dream to accomplish in the business um I just wanna like what I set out to do in wrestling it's like pretty much I already got it like I've, I've always wanted to walk into my job one day and be able to say I'm out of here you know and I wanted to make a living off professional wrestling not have to worry about money you know and then about a year 13 months ago I walked into my job and I said I'm out of here and they're like okay well you know good luck and then uh, since then like I was working at a restaurant uh, you know serving tables and now they have uh, they have my like my first wrestling tights my team Canada ones with you know a couple of eight by tens of me uh, in a like a glass frame thing up on the wall at Applebee's where I used to work you know it's like a hometown hero thing so I mean that's really prestigious and that's why I said dude, I want to just make a living at wrestling and I mean you know it's it's great you know just like bought a new car and it's just that's what I ultimately want to do like as for like success wise in the business I mean I was surprised like I've wanted to get into TNA like not since I was young because it's only been around for three years but you know when TNA came around I'm like you know this is my style this is it you know for me they you know they make decent money and uh you know and then when they gave me the X Division title after I was only with the company for like you know like like three solid months um, I was just like, all right, and I held that for like one of the longest title reigns, and I was like, oh, this is great. I'm like, this is as high as I could go, like in, in TNA. I'm like, you know, and just you know, dream come true, I guess. My last two questions for you is, um, like, how has the internet affected the wrestling business? You feel? Um. Well. I mean, it, it hurts the wrestlers a little bit. A lot of people know about wrestlers' lifestyles, like their personal lives and stuff like that. They know if, like, you know, they can read results or whatever. And wrestlers have to be more creative, can't do the same stuff. Because back in the day, what, uh, you know, house shows, what you do is you do, like, the same match, you know, pretty much. Yeah, you know, and make it easy, you know, on you. And now it's like we always have to be creative and stuff like that. Um, which is great because, you know, it challenges wrestlers. Um, and, you know, everybody always says, like in, in the, like in the big time WWE TNA, what's up, nice boobs, you should be filming that, um, what they say is, you know, internet doesn't matter, they're just smart marks, they're, they're a minimal percentage, but if you look at the biggest story right now, the Matt Hardy thing, you know, everybody knows about it, but look at, like, 20,000 people every single time they go out there. You screwed Matt. You screwed Matt. So when they say internet doesn't give, you know, doesn't matter, it does because rumor gets around. And, you know, I think, I don't know, I, I, think, I think wrestling could play off that because I think they could start using real life story angles um, into wrestling. What well, they just did with the Blue Beanie and Bradshaw. You know, they had them wrestle each other and they knew the real life story with the, you know, the shoot fighting stuff like that, which is great because. You know, I think it makes for good TV. You know, they, they, maybe they should have built it up more on the internet. So when that does happen, you know, like if Matt Hardy came back, think about how huge that would be. You know, like I, I just mean, I, if this is like, like Paul Heyman special. You know what I mean? Like Paul Heyman would have a field day with stuff like this if he still owned a wrestling company. He would like this would be the next wrestling for him. And I think I think that would be great for wrestling. If they took real life scenarios. You know, but then people will start working that, and there'll be a whole big gray area. But I think that would be great for a trend. You know. Well, the last question is, uh, like, what's your opinion? Like, you, you mentioned backyard wrestling a little bit earlier. Like, what's your opinion of backyard wrestling? And what would you say to the backyarders? I mean, if you want to be a wrestler, really train to be a wrestler. I mean, me and Sabin did a clinic one time, like in Iowa, and we had like 16 kids or something like that. You know, we taught them some stuff, and then we're like, okay, you know, we want to see if you guys could put together a five-minute match, you know, with psychology and, uh, 
you know, and, and we'll critique your match, tell you what, you know, some points you guys could do better and stuff. And then there was these two, like, brothers or whatever. It, it, well, we went down the line, we're like, how long have you been wrestling? You know, a year, oh, six months, three years. And then he came up with these two brothers, they're like, life. And we're like, what's life? He's like, forever. And we're like, all right. And then we ask his brother, he's like, the same thing, life, forever. And we're like, what the hell does that mean? You know what I mean? And then they wrestle, and they're like, we're like, put together a match only if you know you can. So, you know, some wrestlers, if they've been there for like a month or something, or if it's their first time, there's no way they're going to be able to do it. You know, they just, they don't know it. Um, like without, you know, properly like not hurting somebody. And the, so these two guys went in there and they're doing everything like on the wrong side, the wrong way. It was pretty much like, we'll lock up. I'll give you a body slam, DDT, suplex. I'll give you five moves. You kick me in the stomach. You give me five moves, then the pin. And I was just like, and we, we stopped and Saban looked at me and he's like, what the hell are we supposed to say to these kids? And I'm like, well, stay, say, you guys had great intensity, and then just, like, you know, that, like, because I'm like, I'm like, like, if, do you think this is what professional wrestling is? So, I mean, for backyarders, I mean, if they, I mean, it's great if you want to goof around with your friends, I mean, outside of wrestling, I goof around with my friends, you know, like, everybody does, you know, and that's great, because that's just, like, you know, that's just being social with other people, but, I mean, to actually, like, have a backyard federation and stuff like that, it's like, People are going to get hurt, you know what I mean? People get hurt when they're professionally trained. It's going to be a lot worse when you're in the backyard or so. Like they say, don't try this at home. So. Cool. Thank you very much.